We're going to be talking about women in global history from 1,000 to 1,800. For the timeline, we're going to be we're going to be uh, talking about uh, various empires and women that were spread across history from over the years. We're going to start off with the Mongo Empire and then move to Ming and Qing empires, and then go over to the Aztec Empire, which will be, and then the next one will be the Ottoman Empire or Islamic Empire. In this presentation, we'll be focusing on a few themes, and some of the themes would be the roles of women. And then, then in addition, we're going to talk about how they're portrayed, their marriage. And when we say emperors, we're talking about emperors and how they decided their wives and how uh, emperors were associated with the women and uh, children. Okay. So we're starting with the Mongol Empire because um, they were the earliest from the years 1206 to 1368. Um, and just like every other empire from this period, um, women weren't allowed to directly rule, so they couldn't fill the role of Khan. But um, elite women, um, they were often able to indirectly influence um, Mongol politics. And that was because, um, well, first of all, we're defining elite women as... Um, women who were like related to powerful leaders in Mongol history and so it was often like through the ways that they raised their sons and like taught them like growing up um that that was how they could influence Mongol politics in the ways they did and they like oftentimes would play like very large role in Mongol politics um so we're going to be talking about two women in particular um we're first going to talk about Ho Lun. Um, she was Genghis Khan's mother. And then we're talking about Sorga Tani Beki, who was the mother of Kublai Khan. So starting with Ho Lun, um, that's a picture of her on the right. But um, she and her husband and like her sons were part of a clan, but um, her husband died. So she was widowed. And um, the clan that they were a part of um abandoned her and her children so after that she started raising them on her own um and her children um and she taught them a lot about unity and supporting one another um that was like something that um she really like made sure that like they knew about growing up and so that um those like values that she taught them that can really be seen in the way that Genghis Khan ruled because at the time, the Mongol Empire enforced a caste system, which um, separated people based off of their ethnic groups and, like, put some people higher than others. Um, but when Genghis Khan came into power, he defied that system. And instead of, like, separating um, these different ethnic groups, um, he instead decided to unite them. Um, so that was something that, like, made him a really powerful and influential ruler. And that was because um, of what his mother had taught him growing up. And also, um, while he was ruling, she served as an advisor for him. So one thing she did that like really contributed to his power was that she would take care of war orphans under him because they would uh the Mongols would often like go out and conquer different territories. And so um when they were dealing with war orphans, um she would take care of them for him. And so um this was helpful because she gained their loyalty um, and that kind of just overall like built the strength of the Mongol Empire and like added to its stability. Okay, and then the second woman we're talking about is Sorgatani Becky and she was the mother of Kublai Khan. And so um, she was a very strong believer in religious tolerance and um, that's actually a quality of the Mongol Empire that, like, kind of made it stand out from every other, like, empire in the world at the time. And so she would taught, she would teach, like, these values to her sons. And obviously this influ this had a big influence on, like, the way they ruled because the Mongols were very tolerant. Like, the Mongol Empire had people of all different religions and they could all coexist, um, which was very different from, like, anything else at the time. And so um, one thing about her that's pretty cool is that she was widowed. Um, so her husband died, but instead of deciding to remarry, she um, decided that it was more important to dedicate her life to raising her sons. And that was because like due to like the um, the way that like power got passed down, her sons were not like next in line to get power. It was going to go to like 
some of their other relatives um and she wanted them to have like power and like ruler positions so she decided to dedicate her life instead to raising her sons and preparing them to be leaders so she would teach them um physical skills like writing archery wrestling and combat and obviously those are all very important because the mongols were like very very um yeah they were like very like big like they had a very big military a very strong military so that was like something that was really important and she also taught them how to read and write in Mongolian so she made sure they were educated as well and um the final thing was that she taught them to like really strictly obey the law and that was important because um as we can see like well a lot of what we learned this year about the Mongols was that they were like very they like put a lot of like value into like complete obedience um like any like like the slightest like disobedience would be very severely punished so she definitely like influenced like their like values in obedience which would like cause them to enforce like very strict obedience and because of like her dedicating her life to her sons and her raising them in the way that she did um they eventually got like leadership positions and like uh, positions of power instead of their other relatives who were next in line to get those power positions. Starting with uh, the overview of women in Ming and Qing, I, the reason why I did them together is because Ming ended up turning into, into Qing later on and Qing adapted a lot of ways that Ming went about treating their citizens. So <clears throat> to start off for women, there was a hierarchical and patriarchal social order based on gender, age, and kin, which means their gender affected their uh, social order, essentially. Wives and children had specifically uh, fam familial roles and obligations, which were separate from men. They served male kin, as well as women were meant for marriage and running a household. So as you can see, the like, woman had different uh, obligations and stuff as men did, which separated them more. For uh, something unique that they did was the government promoted woman chastity, and this constructed and they constructed uh, commemorable arches for widows who uh, honored their husbands and refrained from remarrying. So the government valued valued um, their chastity and not remarrying. So the image you can see on the top that is a really old uh, commemorable arch for a woman who did not remarry. Um, women were believed to were were believed to be unable to fully understand uh complicate complic complicationism. It was believed that serious scholarship and true morality were beyond them, which would kind of separated men and women, but that does not mean that they didn't have a growing literacy and there were actually a lot of female poets. Um for the marriage system, for the Ming and Qing marriage system, the bride was picked by the family and details were arranged by the matchmaker. So the daughters didn't really have any choice in picking who they married. And the daughters were, were raised to be brides. Like that, that was their main role in life, I guess you could say. And they were also required to have children immediately after marriage. And once they were married, they were prescribed new marriage roles. So for Ming and Qing empires or uh, emperors, I wanted to add the emperors in because uh, it's you can see it's a unique way that they decided who they wanted to marry and who they wanted to have children with. So <clears throat> the Ming Dynasty is the founder of Hangu Emperor. Um, he he married Express Ma, who was praised for her compassion and temper that harsh, such a cruel disposition of her spouse, showing that this shows that women had like an important impact on for emperors and how they were viewed. Um, he, <clears throat> there's also a quote. From uh the book, it said he had numerous other he had numerous other consorts as well who bore him twenty six sons and sixteen daughters, and this is to show the emperors really wanted to build their uh, lineage and their bloodline. So they just had consorts separate from their wife that they just had um a lot of sons and a lot of daughters with, just like I said to build their lineage. And the Qing Dynasty uh, second emperor, which was Shunzi Emperor, he had. 32 wives and 14 children. So because I, because emperors uh did 
did more just more than had more children with just one wife. I want to add how the Ming and Qing um just like chose their empress, their wives and the concubines because it shows it shows more uh lineage and it's like unique how uh the Ming and Qing emperors really did it. So <clears throat> all young unmarried women went through a a Zenu pro selection process and the only people that were exempt were already married women and those with certified disabil disabilities. Um, the um, precisely to Shunzi, he excluded most of the Han population because that was just a part of the Qing Empire or because they, um, they're they mostly um, Manchu. So they, uh, he himself uh, excluded most of the Han population. On a selected day, each woman would come with their parents or their closest relatives uh, to present themselves to the emperors, essentially. And the, the four stages that these women had to go through were <clears throat> emperor would decide who's beautiful enough to satisfy the emperor and his parents. And the emperors had to be high ranking status, but concubines were normally just chosen from the general public. Um, they had to be in good physical health, health which this um, narrowed it down to fewer than 100 candidates. Uh, and then finalists were initiated into forms of acceptable behavior and how to speak, gesture, and walk as well as uh, learning new arts. Sir, and then the very last stage, they had to serve the emperor's mother. They were also watched as they slept to notice any bad noctur uh, nocturnal habits like snoring or sleep talking, just because they wanted the empress to be a perfect woman. And then for, strictly for concubines, um, this is kind of unique. Concubines are strictly forbidden to have sex with anyone but the emperor. So if they were selected to be essentially a concubine, they just were not allowed to have sex with anyone but the emperor. They were also required to bathe and be examined by court doctor before the emperor visited their, their bedchamber. So they were just under really strict rules. And lastly, for women in Ming and Qing, for the concubines, <clears throat> many of them spent their lives in the palace without any contact with the emperor. So even if you're selected to be a concubine by the emperor, you might not even be able to have any contact with him whatsoever. And that's it for the Ming and Qing. Uh, going on with the Aztec Empire now, uh, we mainly revolved around the years of about 1428 to about 1529. Uh, women in the Aztec Empire had many limitations compared to men in like the things they could do, but they still had a lot of uh, freedoms compared to women in other um, empires. So in the Aztec, uh, the role of women were mainly tied to their domestic and public lives. Uh, and these domestic roles were like being wives, caring for children, uh, any like house duties outside of those two things. Um, but they also had public roles, which a lot of people don't see in history with women. Uh, but they had the freedom to like craft, sell art, buy stuff from the market and things like that. Um, and a lot of times women would make like a lot of different arts and stuff like that and sell it um, kind of their own like freedom to express themselves and stuff like that. Uh, so that's something interesting I found. Um, and then with marriage, um, women typically got married in their later years. Um, and I mean, back then they had the same, like, um, like they couldn't get as old and stuff like that because the medicine technology and all that. So that was around their late teens uh, and their relatives and families ultimately chose how that marriage happened. Um, in many cases, marriage was used as a way for people to gain political alliances and power within their society. Uh, so two like higher up status families, they wanted to like marry um, just so they could form a, like a bigger alliance and stuff like that. That was commonly seen uh, just to help with ruling and things like that. Um, and then going on with bearing of children, women were solely in charge of delivering children and controlling the household of their families. Um, men would kind of help raise their sons um, to bear their duties while women did the same if they had daughters. Uh, kind of so if like men were like warriors or if they had like certain jobs they would raise the next like age of like boys and men to do the same exact things um and that women did the same things uh so their daughters would like learn to become wives the duties and all that in the household um and because of this gender had a large influence on the roles people performed in the aztec empires and it was kind of seen as well throughout other empires uh that we discussed earlier uh, so going more specifically into like, examples of significant women in the Aztec Empire, um, one that we talked a lot about in um, our lectures and our discussion was uh, Doña Marina. Um, 
And she was the one with Hernan Cortez uh, during the takeover at Tenochtitlan um, and many other surrounding places during that time. Um, and because of her communication abilities, her abilities to translate uh, with the different languages that no one else really knew how to, um, she was able to achieve a lot more status and power and show that women were capable of higher ranking um, if they dis displayed those, uh, I guess, skills at the right time. That's kind of what happened with her. Um, so, I mean, she was a prime example um, within the Aztec Empire that a lot of sources uh, took note upon. Um, and then another one I wanted to add was more like of a spiritual and religious side of things. Um, just because in the Aztec Empire, they did have a large religious factor to them and they're like a large spiritual facet. Um, but uh, many significant women within the Aztec Empire mainly came from their religion and their belief in gods and goddesses. Um, and then two that I included, uh, two well-known goddesses, uh, was uh, she of the Jade Skirt. Um, and she ruled over like water, storms, and protected women and children. Um, and that was a really big thing because with their agricultural side of things, uh, just with the women and children and how they function in their societies, um, a lot of people did look up to this goddess uh, to make sure those things were able to occur properly, function properly, and things like that. Uh, and then the other one I wanted to include was the goddess of life and death. Um, she was birthed in the sun and the heaven, then invented the life cycles of men and women and kind of controlled over those things. Um, so those two goddesses were kind of like well known within the Aztec empire that um, a lot of like citizens and people looked up to. And that is it for my part. And then finally, uh, onto the Ottoman empire, uh, this uh, empire lasted between around 1299 uh, to about 1922. Um, going going off with some background about the Ottoman Empire, the spread of Islam originated and kind of was influenced uh, with a messenger named Muhammad and his teachings. Um, and he, he taught uh, in favor of women. Uh, a lot of his primary supporters were actually women. Uh, he taught that both men and women were, were uh, spiritual equals. Um, and then going on to, to their rights, uh, upper class women, uh, secluded, uh, were secluded into their homes. Um, that was kind of their primary role. Um, they didn't really have, um, a religious, uh, like they didn't really have roles in religious affairs. It was basically non-existent at the time. Um, they still did have legal rights in the court, more specifically towards marriage and arranged marriage cases. Um, it did protect them more or less uh, from consent of these marriages. Um, and the court system drew on the Quran to interpret uh, the Islamic law. And then uh, there are two women that I'd like to discuss uh, about the uh, in, within the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so women, women during in this time period achieve their status uh, by how close uh, they were to the sultan at the time and so the majority of women in power were actually uh, the wives of the sultan so uh, I want to start off by um, discussing about the first sultan harem sultan um, she impressed the sultan by her intelligence and even advised uh, him on matters of state so here you can see that uh, she's already holding a position of power, um, managing uh, stuff like matters of state. Um, she also had many children uh, with the sultan, which got her closer to the sultan, and it thus gained her more power. Uh, and then she later on, she used this power to establish a, a political presence and provide for the community, like building a charitable institutions. And the next one is Safi Sultan. Uh, once again, the closer she got to the Sultan, the more she was able to establish her own political power. Um, and she used this political power to preserve the traditions of the court and the original vision of the Ottoman Empire altogether, um, which resulted in plenty of allies during her time period. So here, here we see that uh, the the closer you were to the Sultan uh, and the the women played more of a uh the role as a wife um but yeah here you see that they they were able to establish uh some sort of political power next to the sultan and then to conclude uh there were vast d differences in the roles women played throughout each time period yet some some uh did continue to overlap 
Uh, history had shown many occasions where women extended above the roles that were viewed upon uh, by society. And finally, the most influential women showed substantial contributions toward the success longevities of their respective empires uh, in, in one way or another. Um, 